So what I want to discuss or at least introduce you to is the relationship between a biological swarm and how that's moved across to swarms in robotics and what sort of robots we use for swarm robotics and what sort of applications. So we've got a summary. Oops. We've got some an you know, what is a swarm? I think we've got to be very careful when we define what a swarm is because that's the whole basis. In other words, it's the, it's the building block of swarm robotics is a clear definition of what a swarm is. Advantages of having a swarm, why the bees swarm? Why the people swarm? There's a real underlying reason which we've got to look at. And can we move between a robotic swarm, biological swarm, both ways, forwards and backwards? And also, can we move these swarms from basically the laboratory bench into the real world? So we've got to look across that sort of domain. Now, just as an introduction, my background, I am an electronic electrical engineer with some knowledge of computer science. I am not a biologist or a zoologist. So we will concentrate firstly on the biological side, then I can move into something which I know slightly more about, and that's the robotics. But what I want to first introduce is the concept of biorobotics. So we've got, as John said, we've got birds flocking and we've got a robotic swarm. First glance, those are not related, but there is a science called biorobotics, which runs between those two domains. And we can actually understand this. It is the intersection of robotics and biology. Now that's it's not one of the most obvious branches of science, but it is actually something which is actually very interesting and very fundamental to some work. And we can use biology to build robots. And if you look at most robots, at least we, they're very anthropomorphic. We talk about robots, wrists, robots, arms, robot elbows. So there's always that sort of relationship, but can we actually drill deeper into that? And also, you know, can we build robots to understand biology? In other words, use robotics to actually model biological systems. Now it's quite obvious that some things are very obvious and some things aren't obvious, but we've got three bullet points here. We can have robots that are modeled on organisms, models for organisms, and also models of organisms. So you can actually do three things with them. So, whoops, so we can actually model and use biology as a source of ideas. We can use robotics as a technology, as a source of ideas for the biologists. And we can actually use the robotics as a simulator to actually test hypotheses from biology. And one of the sort of the best papers on this is from Barbara Webb, who actually put together this list of what we actually can do. So on the simple sensory motor control, We've got the chemical, which we'll actually talk mainly about this evening, such as moth and ant and lobsters plume following, the pheromones. We can actually use robotic systems to actually test how people or animals hear. How does the cricket hear? How does an owl use its sound to locate? We can come up with a hypothesis, then we can build a robotic system or an engineering system, which will actually demonstrate what's going on. That sonar, and then we've got visual, which is something which is very interesting. How do bees sense speed and direction? There's an experiment which is very famous, which we, we haven't got time to discuss. We actually can move bees physically in flight by, by tricking them. Praying mantis, why do birds nod their heads? Why do pigeons go like that? That's the sort of thing which we can answer through that technology. And then the more complex ones, which are perhaps the ones which people are more familiar with. We've got walking, we've got swimming, we've got flying, we've got navigation. But I want to stick with the simple systems and take it from there. So just before we get into it, let's just want to look at some definitions. There's a few more definitions which will come through in the presentation, but this is one of the key ones. In other words, what is intelligence? Now, you, you're going to the 
the one little thing called the World Wide Web and say, what is intelligence? And you get 150,000 different answers. So I said, well, can't do that. So I then went for a paper which said, here's 40 different definitions of intelligence, which we boiled down to sort of like, this is the, the best we can drag out of this thing. And so it's a property of the individual agent is to interact with the environment or the environment. So it's how we interact with that something, how we change that to achieve our goal. And that's fairly clear. As long as you keep that in your mind, that's what means by intelligence. Now, the one point you've got to note as you look at some of these slides is I tend to use the word agent. It's partly habit and partly there's something, there's something back behind it. We use the term agent as, as an entity. That could be a physical entity, a computing bit of software, or something similar, a robot. So by using the word agent, it's the sort of the in the phrase to use for this sort of activity. And also the other thing that you'll find is a lot of these applications, you'll see something which is called the emergent behavior come out of it. In other words, we're looking at behavior which you cannot predict from doing a one-off analysis of the system. The classic example of emergent behavior is that path which runs across the corner of the lawn, because that's the way everybody walks. Everybody, you should think that everybody goes around on the, on the pavement, but no, they'll take a cross across and take the shortest route. That is the emergent behavior. And there's many other different types of emergent behavior that you know about and you've come across, no doubt, in daily lives. So let's look at an intelligent robot. This is Machina Spectralix, commonly called a turtle or tortoise, or Elsie and Eleanor, actually, by William Gray Walton in the 1940s. Now, remember, this is the 1940s. Colossus had just been built. There was no computing technology. However, this robot, to the observer, it's got to be that way around, showed a degree of intelligence. And it demonstrated artificial life. So it had basically the two things we tend to do at our base level. We went searching, we went hunting, we went looking for things. And then occasionally got hungry and it came back and fed. Or more correctly, it went into a garage and got charged up by a couple of electrodes. But that's the type of thing. In other words, it came back when it had had enough searching which batteries running low. And as I said, there's no programming. But the only problem is, I can't describe quite actually how it works because that's the controller and it has things called valves. So this is very much like what we call a Breitenberg vehicle. It, it looks at light, etc. So effectively, if you go from one side, you've got a photoelectric cell, there's a number of relays, there's two valves, a couple of switches, and that's it. But when you put two of them together, they'll come together, they'll, they'll interact together, they'll tap and knock each other, move around each other, searching for the environment. But at a certain time, they'll say, oh, I'm hungry. And they'll come down to the bottom, which is where you've actually got two little hutches. And they'll go into those hutches. And they're driven into that hutch because they like the, the light, they see the light at the back of the hutch. And so they actually are sensitive to light. When they're not hungry, they tend to go away from light. And when they are running low energy or hungry, they'll move towards the light. So you have that sort of behavior, which is unpredictable. You, from that circuit, you could not predict that behavior. And that's what we're trying to get out of swarm robotics. I think one of the things you've got to remember is that swarm robotics or swarming is a collective behavior. It needs more than one thing to do it. And as you go up through the sort of the hierarchy of biological systems, natural world, you will actually see swarming behavior at various different levels. So here we are, bacteria. So bacteria will swarm. That's the only way they actually can actually operate. One bacteria, um, I think, is totally useless. But when you've got a couple of million bacterium and get that bacteria, you've got something which is actually quite um, powerful in its world. So you've got that. When we go up again, 
Uh, I seem to have lost the term. I, oh, when I, don't worry about it, it may come up again. We've got birds. We've got fish. We've got quadrupeds. Now, when we talk about swarm, you don't often think of a cow, or in this case, some elk, as, as a swarm. But they're showing the same basic behavior that your little termite, your little ant can do. And you'll find that you get the same sort of thing in a crowd. So these global collections of animals, bacteria, everything, will actually operate as a swarm. Now, the, one of the simplest ones to understand, and as a good introduction, is we look at a flock of birds, which we've just seen. And we can show that, or we can hypothesize really, we haven't really asked the bird what they do. We can actually say, why does that set of birds, which flying around randomly, gather into flocks. And they can do that because they embody with three rules. That's all they have, there's three rules. Line, they steer towards the average heading of the neighbor. So they look out there, they're all tending to move that way. So they'll move in that direction. And that's one of the rules. The second rule is to steer towards the average position of the neighbors. So they'll try to get into the middle of the neighboring bots or, 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 or birds. And also they'll then go the other way and say, we, well, we don't want to get too close to them. So we'll get some separation. So those two tend to operate uh, to keep them in the right position. Because of that, they will go from this sort of random pattern to this sort of flocking behavior. Now, I've got a, a little video. What I'll do is there's two little videos which I'll try to show at the end because I don't want to disturb the screen sharing and all the technology we're going to fall over if we're not careful. So that is how we actually can swarm and, and get some birds to flock. Now, we've got to ask one other question. Why? What's the understanding of these? What's the benefit of actually swarming? Again, I've used the word agent, but they can be anything. It can be anything from a quite sizable cow through to ants and, and bacteria. There are three basic requirements, the three basic objectives. Firstly, reproduction. Ants, particularly, will make these very complicated nest structures solely to look after the colony and to make sure that colony multiplies correctly. And in many cases, that's aided by the division of labor. And when we actually look at ants, we will actually bring that point out. Defense. Remembering, of course, you've got the surface area of your swarm compared to the volume of your swarm. You're going from an R squared to an R cubed, effectively, very crudely. So, again, if you get that defense right, you've got a slightly, you know, we've got a less surface area to be attacked. And you'll find that fish tend to school into, into spheres when the, you know, there's a predator around. And migration. It's the easiest way to actually migrate. If you send one bird down to the South of Africa in migration, that bird's going to get nowhere. But if you send a whole flock of them down there, they will actually reinforce, get the direction better, and they'll they move. And again, they'll have that defense, and to a certain extent, they have that reproduction benefit. So that is why animals or agents swarm. Now, let's look at and start to work at some of the more complex ones. Flocking is fairly simple. We've got this character. This character is a termite, one of many. It's Macrotermus subhyalinus or Rambo. That's a good way of pronouncing it. About 70 millimeters long, at least the worker bee. The person does the work about 70 millimeters long. The queen's far bigger. At the end of the day, they can actually build a structure which is quite a vast 
four, five meters tall. And, and as you can see, there's more than just one of them. And each of those buildings effectively is a, is a, holds a very large colony. We're talking of millions of ants. But how did they do it? Why did they do it? We know why they do it, but let's look at how they do it. There isn't, like the queen who is, who is inverted commas, is, 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 this, is why they have to build this to keep the queen safe. Doesn't sit there and say to the group of worker bees, here's the plan. We're going to build a structure like that. And here's the X, Y coordinates where I want my chamber built. Here's where the brood's going to be and here's where X is going to be. Nothing. You're dealing with ants and termites, which are basically, they just about can walk and move things, and that's it. They're very simple. There's a division of labor, which we're not going to worry about tonight, but that again, the, the queen will reproduce, the workers do the work. Some of the other ones will actually look after the, 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 the baby insects. Baby insects will, will be right. So there's multiple interaction. Everything moves together. You look inside some of these nests, things actually move very rapidly. People bump it up. Ants bump into each other. So there is that, that degree of randomness. But the important thing is, there's positive and negative feedback. So there's recruitment and reinforcement. And it's the reinforcement I want to look at is how we actually can reinforce this behavior. And this will come back. You look at the slides in, in retrospect, you see this phrase again and again. It's reinforcement, reinforcement learning, and how do we reinforce it? And then you also got the negative feedback. There's a limited number of available skills. You've only got the queen, some workers, some soldiers, and that's it. So you're very limited of what you actually can do and what sort of scope you've got. So let's look firstly, what I want to end up with is, is actually how we actually construct the Queen's Chamber. But firstly, let's look at the interactions. So termites are a social insect. We, we define them as social because they tend to aggregate. They go and swarm. They aggregate individuals and operate as a functional unit. So they have that common goal. And the common goal is to make sure that their swarm goes to the next generation. They will create these spatial temporal structures, which is a very fancy way of saying they'll lay down a trail, the ants will follow that trail, et cetera, et cetera. And that trail will change over time, but it doesn't change rapidly over time. So there is that sort of time element. So you've got foraging trails, you've got the nest architecture, it all comes from that. Their behavior will change as some parameters change. So if there's not being, a, if the queen starts to a rupee that's rate decreases, you'll find another queen will come along. In other words, the hormones within the swarm will change, so another queen will come to the surface. They will move from some coordinated to non-coordinated and vice versa. So they'll move across this coordination. But to do that, they've got to pass a trigger level. So if you've got a group of them, they will do one thing. If you've got two or three groups, they'll go and do something else. And what they do is they will use biological triggers. The biological triggers are the hormones within the individual termites, the fungi, because within this colony, there's a large amount of fungus and fungi, some of which um, does part of what an ant does, it, it, that helps their digestion of food, it will process their food, etc. And also these magic things called pheromones, which will allow a termite to guide themselves through that in sort of environment. But one thing we've got to say, there's nothing very magic about pheromones, at least at the top level. I think you're all familiar with them, in other words, they will leave a scent. But more importantly, the termite or the ant can actually sense more than one different type of pheromone. So this is a result of a simulation, which I did some time ago. This is from the University of Sussex. 
And if you go to that web address, you can actually play with this wonderful tool which shows this ant colony taking food from these green objects or butterflies, etc. There's only four variables in this model. In fact, some of the models we'll see later on, there's even less of a number of variables. Firstly, there's the amount of pheromone, there's some pheromone deposited at the food. So on the green blobs at the top, something will, will go on to that. So that will mark it. There's some which are deposited on the trail. So again, as they come back, once they're successful, they'll come back and they'll lay a pheromone on the way back. But that's moderated. And it's important to remember it's moderated by evaporation and diffusion. And it's the evaporation and diffusion against the amount of pheromone deposited which leads the trail in the right direction. And that is the important thing to note, that it's that diffusion and evaporation which controls the actual activity. So let's have a very simple look at this. Right, I'm going to, oh, it looks far better on the screen than it does on the, the laptop. So this is a cross section through a Queen's new chamber. So you've got the Queen in the centre, you've got a group of worker bees around there. And what firstly happens is Queen will sort of get her workers and the workers will tend to circulate around Queen and so they will know what the pheromone is. And after a certain amount of time, the pheromone the Queen emits will permeate this space. And it's the pheromone, that pheromone which will actually dictate the size. So at a certain point, the workers get, will scoot off from the queen and move towards or down the gradient of the pheromone. And when they actually get down to the gradient, they will reach a point where their logic, because that's effective, it is, they will take a sniff of the air and say the pheromone is about right. And that is how big the queen's chamber is. They don't get a ruler out. They'll actually work on how far they will actually have to move. And so we've there we got a little ant chugging across there, holding a bit of soil. So once they leave around the queen, they'll actually pick up some soil and move towards that point. When they reach that point, they will put on that soil in and out with the first building block. They will then mark that with another pheromone. That's not to really show you where it is, that's to give them the exact point at which they've got to put the next block of soil. They'll then come back down the, the blue line putting pheromone down there as they come back. So when they come back out again, they'll follow the pheromone with, on the trail up to the area where that red dot is. Then they'll go onto the green pheromone, which will give them the exact position where they will put the next drop of soil. And again, they will mark it with more pheromone, etc. So what they will do is you will actually start to build a structure. Now imagine this in three dimension because this, the, the pheromone will actually form a, a, a half sphere and you will actually build around that. And it's that little green blob that gives them the clue to make sure the structure is stable. Because if you start putting random blobs around there, you won't get a stable structure. So they'll build little pyramids, little towers, which will grow. And at the end, they will actually meet at the top and therefore you will get that structure. Now, another day, there may have be a different pheromone and there'll be a wind blowing through the termite nest. And so you'll get a tube, which will go out to the surface. And it's this sort of using the pheromone, using the ants to actually look for that pheromone and coming up to specific values 
allows them to actually build these very complicated structures. There's no master plan, it's just done like that. So if we actually summarize what we've just discussed, we will get the sort of the general properties. This is a bit, uh, it really summarizes effectively what was said so far. So the many simple homogeneous agents. There's no central control, and that's something you've got to keep fixed. There's no central control. There's a collective behavior that emerges. There's no, there's no plan. This just emerges. Adaptability, robustness, and scalability. In the robustness here, we, I've got there's two or three definitions of robustness. The robustness here means that if one ant drops dead, we don't worry about it. In other words, there's enough mass of ants in the colony that to lose one ant doesn't really cause the, the colony any problem. So they are, and they're scalable and adaptable. Important thing to bottom that by pursuing the specific goal, dispersing an environment, communicating, and memorizing. So to an extent, they'll memorize the locals, the, the, their states, the words that they know when they're carrying soil, when they're not carrying soil. They're carrying soil, they go out, not carrying soil, they go in. So, so that's the biology. So question we've then asked, is can we use this sort of basic understanding of these swarms and apply it to robotics? And the answer is yes, but the yes comes, as you'll see, with a large number of caveats. So in about back end of the 1980s, we got a field of swarm intelligence, which is a subset of artificial intelligence. So we're looking at artificial intelligence and said, right, we can do it this way, or we can do it by using a large number of small um, bits of computer code, small robots, etc. And the formal definition, if you want it, is it's a collective behavior of decentralized and self-organized systems, comprising a relatively simple agents interacting locally with one another and with the environment. That is what we've seen in biological swarms, and this is what we want to apply to in robotic swarms. Applications, as we go further through, we'll see more applications. Swarm robotics, but also we can use this sort of swarm intelligence for financial forecasting, crowd modeling, and data mining, and there's a few of which will come along. So swarm robotics is just one application of swarm intelligence, but it's the one I want to concentrate on. Without giving you and boring you with another definition, um, it's, that's effectively the previous one of swarms written with the word robot in its place. So you go to the journals, you say, what is a swarm robot? And you get 20 different journal papers and you get 20 different robots. This is sort of a sort of these are, the, these are the better ones. No, I won't say that. These are the ones which are the most, that, that tends to be the rise. To, if it's like foam, you'll find that certain robot types tend to rise to the top of the foam, and those are the ones that everybody remembers. This one is, is called Killerbot. For no apparent reason, is they, they actually managed to have a swarm of a thousand of them. So if you go back to the first slide where I showed a flock of, flock of birds, next to it was a thousand of these Killerbots. 33 millimeters in diameter, so it's fairly small. And the important thing to now remember is what the communication distance is, and this is about 70 millimeters. So anything outside 70 millimeters, they don't know it's there. So it's very densely packed. And the two silver things are the batteries. The hooker is to allow it to charge. You're gonna say, where are the wheels? This doesn't have wheels. This has little vibrating motors driving those three tripods, or the three legs of the tripod. So if you hear one of these swarms, it sounds like a swarm, because they just buzz continually. So that's, that's one of them. And that was, that's from Harvard University. This is, this is Swarmbot. This is a fairly big one. This is a European one. 
and it's got Wi-Fi communication. It has a bigger sensor suite. It has a fairly complex sensor suite, and it's it's about 34, 40, 30 centimeters high. So it's quite a high one, quite big. It has tracks. The thing you should note, and we'll come back to it later on, is it's got a little gripper at the front. That's the it's a bit difficult to see, but if you look at the front, it's got a little gripper, and it's got a ring around there, so they can actually grip and hold on to one another. And it's got tracks on this one. Uh, we've got from Cornell University, we've got the droplet, uh, infrared communication, same sort of movement, little piezoelectric sensors or actuators. Um, the important thing to remember about this one, this one is a very good one, but it has a little cheek and it, it doesn't have any battery. If you look at the floor, you can see it's in stripes. So when two legs are across on two different stripes, that's how it charges, or at least short charges, and that's how it gets its power. So when I was teaching, I set students a goal. Let's build a Southampton one. And this is what, this, this is, that's the danger of letting Eminem students build a robot. This is a very good example. I said, right, guys, you've got, 30 quid to build this, or more correctly, if we're going to build a thousand of them, that's what it's got to actually cost. Um, they took that seriously, and that will cost you 30 pounds in parts to build if you're buying a thousand of them. Um, the central process is, in fact, an ARM Cortex M0 microcontroller, which is a fairly powerful beast. So, this is a fairly powerful thing, at least computationally. Um, we've got proximity sensors. Uh, those are the little white things which are dotted around. There's, one, two, there's eight of those. It's got an IMU and a wood it has its onboard gyroscope, so it knows which way it's going. Uh, it's got point of interest sensing. There's a sensor which looks at the floor. Communication. It's got six communication ports, which are again optics. But I'll come back to this, we, we keep talking about putting infrared sensors, optical sensors, optical transmitters and receivers, but those come with a penalty. And it's got an expansion port. If anybody knows an Arduino board, those headers will fit that Arduino, so you can actually stack the Arduino boards on top of this. And again, you've got programming boards. So it's a very powerful robot, computationally powerful, physically, very, very limited what it can do at its present time. It can run around the, uh, the floor like this very easily, and it can interact. So it can do the aggregation, it can do the swarming. And so that's, that's a, a, a system, and we'll come back to an application which we actually did some work on later on. So I think we've got to sort of Say, look at the system. Why do we do this? What's, what's the benefits of it? Firstly, the tasks we, we're doing are very complex, or complexity is very high for a single robot. So we need large numbers of robots to do it. And some of the applications we'll look at towards the end are, are that sort of type. The individuals are relatively homogeneous. They're all the same. Well. We, we spent three years arguing about this. No robot is the same. Every robot you build is different. And so within their sort of, and it's the same with ants. So within their control structure, there's enough leeway in, in the control structure to recognize that these thousand robots will react in a thousand different ways. Maybe only very slightly, you know, five or six percent is all you're talking about. But over a period of time, over a period of a large area, surface area, it can be different. The individuals are relatively capable, as you've seen. They increase robustness through redundancy. In other words, again, that's the same thing with the analysis. If one of robots fails in a thousand, you can just be pushed it to one side and ignore it. Communication is limited. We're down to bits per second on this, this system. Simple rules and no information. And that's it, you get as much information at the local area you can do. 
and it's scalable. So if you have a swarm of 100 one day, then you have a swarm of 1,000 next day, you don't have to change the software. So you can just add more robots at nausea. How do we control them? Now, there's many different ways of controlling them, but it comes down to two real variants. So you've seen one of them. You've seen the particle swarm optimization approach. That's effectively how we actually make the birds flock. So the agents will fly through that search space. They'll make some, they'll search, they'll make some decision on the information to go as they do that searching. Then we've got ant colony up. Ant colony optimization. And this is what I want to talk a bit more detail about. The artificial ants construct solutions using biological triggers. Now, don't worry that we're talking about robots, just accept that we're using triggers, i.e., something in the, in the environment is giving a trigger in the system which will make it move forward. And the pheromones, whatever a pheromone is in a swarm robot, we'll discuss that in a second, I'll mention it makes that solution is the attractive point of that solution. Now, I just want to just go a bit further down the ant cotton. Now, it sounds very complicated, but like most of these things at the bottom level, the concept is very simple. You have food and you have a nest and you have this pipe between them. Now, in the start, those ants are going to go up that tube. They're going to go around the little loops. So the ants will search randomly. So there's that random element. So when your ants start building the queen's chamber, they'll go out in every single direction. Then the returning ants, either ants that have been successful in finding the food, will come up and start laying their pheromone. Now, some of them will go around the loops, some will go straight up. But the pheromone which is laid around the loop is going to evaporate as well as the pheromone going up thing. So you, what you'll do, you'll find that up and down you will get the pheromone trail while what's going around the loop, it's longer, therefore it has to be there for a longer time, will decay. And so the more times they go up and down, they'll reinforce it. So it's a probabilistic technique. So we're looking at totally random events, but it is reinforcement learning. So we are reinforcing the path which we actually want to take. So it's an optimal route for a graph, job share, you know, your Amazon delivery depends on using this sort of algorithm. So communication, we talked about like biological swarms, direct, indirect, and stigma energy, and those are fairly clear. How do we do it in a robot? Well, we use optical emitters. We use optical LEDs for everything. Proximity, distance measuring, communication, except those will take around about 10 milliamps each. Then you sit down and do the mathematics. You look at your energy budget, and you find you're using more energy in your optical emitters and receivers than you are doing on your processor and your motors in certain examples. So that's what the problem is. It's the energy. Artificial pheromones. Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, depending on what you're doing. If we're doing it in a room like this, we could put a camera in the roof, in the ceiling, and we can look at all our little robots running around here. We put a little X on all of them, or a number, and that will be our artificial pheromone. In other words, the computer will actually generate the pheromone. If we're going out into the field, that will not work. And communication, we can use Bluetooth, we can use Wi-Fi, or we can use LoRo, which is, in fact, a very low power consumption, low speed method of communication by radio. So the important thing is that if you're in the lab, you can use one approach. If in the real world, you have to use different approaches. And so that's a sort of a up-to-date list of taxonomy of robotic behavior. 
Uh, so you've got spatial organization, aggregation. I'll show an example of this in a second. Navigation, collective transport, collective localization, search and rescue type things. Decision making, collective fault, definition of collective perception, and miscellaneous self healing, self reproduction, and human swarm interaction. So that's what the current research field in, in swarm robotics is, and that summarizes it very clearly. So we've got the research area and we've got the real world and we'll, we'll look at that now so in aggregation we've got pattern forming so rope, swarm ropes are very good at forming patterns so you give it a pattern say form a letter k on the floor so you give that to a thousand kilowatts kilowatts they will actually be able to form that pattern on the floor by using the right control algorithms they can construct structures. We can scan and map areas, and that's very useful. That's part of SLAM. Searching for and transporting objects. Medical research, particularly in looking at immune systems, how cells react to drugs, et cetera, and biological modeling, as we mentioned. But let's take one example. I want to get a group of robots to build a bridge. Now, this is, this is like a group of swarming insects building a bridge. I want to construct a path across a void to allow robots to cross. Very simple. Okay. Constraints and rules. So we've got to set the rules. Firstly, there's no centralized control. Any robot control the construction. And that's important. Limited communication. They can say, I'm here. Come, and come towards me, go away from me. That's about it. Stability, which we'll talk about in a second. And they have virtually no sensing capability. Right, so here is our little Octobot, which we did the work with. And so it looks at its downward looking sensor and will randomly go around and says, here's our Void and it'll come up to the edge and stop. And then when it stops, it says to all its other people in the swarm, come towards me, we'll build ourselves a structure. And so it communicates, and the next one comes along. And it does this under it builds a structure. It builds a structure. Hang on. Yeah. And They'll actually do that. You, you may have spotted the elephant in the room, is how you actually get these to connect. I'll, I'll briefly discuss how we can do that. But they'll go there, and once you have about three or four together, you can move one robot forward. Nothing more, or you'll stand to become unstable. Another one will join, goes forward, goes forward. Now, if you look at a lot of these bridge building robots, they tend to do it with no real bridge. It goes across a black bit of paper, etc. But we asked the very basic question, how can we actually join two ropes together easily? We talked, you know, we put magnets. Uh, we, how do you get rid of a magnet, magnetic field, power, etc. So effectively, what we did is between each of those two robots, we actually had a drogue. It rather like how spacecraft tend to dock. You have a ring, you have a probe which goes through that ring, and then that probe will open it and pull things back together. And by having a ring there, you actually can get some degree of error. So if you're coming in at about five or six degrees off the normal path, you'll still be able to connect. And then you can lock the thing together with both that drogue pulling tight and pins operating, etc. It's a challenge. We've got all the mathematics. We just want a thousand robots to just prove the point. Right. So we we talked about the research world. Right. The question that everybody asks is: We've got these wonderful technology. Can we move that technology into the real world? Now, the real world is quite a messy place. It's not got flat floors. It has all sorts of problems. But there's many applications. We've got environmental monitoring, monitoring, and that's one of the great ones. We can actually go out, if we have a swarm, a little swarm of robots, we could go through the new forest, 
looking at the fauna and flora. We could go across the solvent, looking at what the pollution levels are, etc. We've got autonomous aerial activity. Don't confuse these with drones. These, these are totally autonomous systems. So we can actually do the same thing looking across the canopy. We're farming. Go and collect, the, you know, go out into fields and pick the weeds or pick the crops. Civil engineering, building bridges. But we'll worry about that later on. And space exploration. Um, those are the sorts of types of things. You know, people, there's plans of, you know, you can build your Mars base, no doubt Elton Musk is going to do this and put large numbers of robots there. But they no, won't be swarm robots, but fairly intelligent robots. But that's the type of thing which we want to look at. But how do we implement this? And this is one of the things we got to worry about. So when I prepared this talk, I, I said, right, got, let's get the latest information. And you look at all these application areas, and you've always got the same sort of thing. This application is in early development. We've opposed that. We're in the study phase. That means they've still got a couple of research students and a pen and paper. That's the type of, that's the level we are. We're at that sort of level. You may find there's some very specialist ones, but a true swarm robot in a true swarm, I think it would be very difficult to find a reliable, real world application. Why? Now, there is, you may have sussed some of the problems of what I've said. You've got the problem with the platform design. I know the platforms which we've seen. In fact, even, even our Octobot is a fairly robust platform, but it is not something you would want to put inside uh, in the new forest or something similar. In a moderately benign urban environment, it could work, but it is actually that mobility in the difficult terrain. And once you talk about mobility, you then talk about power supply, and that is one of the problems we've got to face. And also the physical robustness. Will it stand up to going around very large distances and, and meeting the real world. It's wet, it's damp, it's dusty, etc. Then you've got the inter-robot communications. As soon as you've got the real world, levels change. So you will not have this line of sight. It may not be possible. So you've got that problem to worry about. And finally, you've got a very complicated, if you've got Wi-Fi, etc., you've got a very complicated radio frequency environment, which you've got to marry this system into. But the swarm size, cost, well, we talk, we talk, you know, this, this robot costs us 30 pounds in parts. Yep, 30 pounds in parts, assembly, testing, programming. So, you, you know, we 30 pounds comes up to a couple of hundred pounds per robot very quickly, and that's for a very simple one. And then you say, right, we've got our, let's just say we've got our robot or robots, we have a thousand robots, we want to put them into the new forest. But they only can talk about a distance of two or three robots distant. So in you know size of this room, we put a thousand robots. So we're overpopulating the environment. We actually are changing the environment by the robots we're putting into it. Uh, if we're building an ant's nest, that's perfectly acceptable. If we're trying to do a biological or ecological survey or something, the only thing the centre robots are going to say is there's a robot next to me. That's not very good. And then you've got to maintain that robot density. Yes, we talk about these things being robust, but then one falls over, then two fall over, and then we've got to keep putting more and more robots into that sort of environment. So there is some very serious technical, both on, on the power side and also on the swarm size, to get these things operating. So how can we get around this? Well, we, we try to get around it by sort of cheating a little bit. Firstly, we could redefine ourselves and say, we're not going to put a swarm, we're going to put a multi-robot swarm in. So the swarm size is 10 to 20, but we have global communication. So that means we've got far more distance robots, but we've got global communication. That does not lie with the definition of swarm robotics, as I put, discussed tonight. So those are not really swarm, but that's one solution if you want it. 
you've got global hop versus multi hop again but you've still require that central process capability cloud robotic swarms now this on paper sounds very good because you're moving all the computing power from the robot you're putting it into the cloud but you've got a very high bandwidth low latency so you really will have some communication problems. So the best possible solution is, is the one at the bottom, which is actually may sound counterintuitive, what I've talked about this evening. And that is you move towards what we call a sparse swarm. So if you're going to do a, a survey of the new forest, we don't want to put a thousand robots in the new forest. We want to put about, you know, perhaps five or six robots. Limited amount of capability. So they will trundle around. Limited capability means better power budget, so they're trundle around for longer. They explore that local information. They can sense that local information. But going back to the swarm room, they'll also be able to talk to one another. Now we say talk in vertical commas. We're not bursting information across at megabits to them. We're going to use this this technology called low ray, which is the Internet of Things type approach, and that will give us roundabout. Um, 100, 200 bits per second. So very slow, but it's enough to give that into robot communication at the same time as letting the swarm run wild. So that's, that's, those are three approaches, which may be, as I said, counterintuitive. And I think to an extent, the swarm, sparse swarm is the way that some of the applications move forward because it gets out the problem of having to have vast numbers of small robots, but getting things which are a little bit more sophisticated. So, um, that's wrong. Let's go over that. There we are. So that's what I wanted to talk about. So swarm robotics, inspired by nature. So we're looking at what termites can do. We're looking at what ants can do. I'm saying very simple structure, very simple intelligence. We can use this very easily. It's, as I said, it's part of artificial intelligence, swarm intelligence. You can undertake, and this is the important thing, if you get the right swarm, you can do tasks which are quite complex, using very simple things like moving people, like moving construction, etc. They're very significant research tools. But as I said, the real world application, there's, you can sit here tonight and we can think of very many applications, but it's moving from that thinking to actually get something which is a, a swarm robot and not just a drone or, or an automated, autonomous guided vehicle, but something which is actually goes and has this true swarm sort of, is a true swarm insect or swarm robot and use it within the research environment. So for those of you who are, whoops, so we've got some references and some uh, other things we can make. The Barbara Wen one that I recommend, and somebody has nicked my copy of Arkin, but Arkin's book is an absolutely superb book to read, but thank you very much indeed.